Oh, you're recording. Okay, thanks for inviting me uh, and thanks for being here. Uh, my story begins with uh, um, probably the way the first uh, uh, talk in this uh, workshop started. Uh, and this is an, a, a game with a set A of action, a two, pairs, two player zero sum game with a set A of actions, a finite set A of actions for every player. And at period zero, player one chooses A zero from A, at period one, player two chooses A one, then, then they choose, alternatingly, they choose sequence of actions. And player one wins if the infinite path that they created is in some set W. And W is the winning set of player one. Okay. Uh, the uh, twist I'm going to do on this uh, model is in the monitoring. Monitoring is the fancy words that uh, game theorists use to talk about what I know as a player about previous actions of my opponent, right? So uh, this is what's called monitoring and a couple of obvious examples. Full monitoring means that I, I observe past actions of my opponents. So the standard Borel game uh, model is in my language, a model with full monitoring. Okay, this is Borel games. You can also look at no monitoring. No monitoring means that I don't know what my opponent played in the past. Uh, here is something more complicated. This means that player one has full monitoring, or when I say player one, I mean the even player, the players that plays in even periods. So uh, uh, player one has full monitoring. And player two at period 2K, period uh, uh, 2K plus one, uh, only observes the actions up to period 2K minus two. It means that when period that when I'm coming to play uh, a five, I don't yet know a four. I only observe a zero and a two. It is as if I observe opponent's play with delay one. This looks a bit concocted, but in fact, it's a model that you just saw in uh, Ronstock, right? This essentially means that when I come to play A5, I don't know A4, right? I only know A0 up to A3. It means that when I come to play A5, I can think about myself as playing simultaneously with player one. It is as if actions A4 and A4, A5 are chosen simultaneously and independently. So this model, all the thing that I just wrote, all the long story that I just wrote, is essentially what's usually called Blackwell game. Okay. And another uh, uh, possible uh, monitoring structures is uh, each player observe opponents action with delay one. Now, not only player two has, doesn't observe the previous action, but only player, also player one doesn't observe the previous action. And there are many other structure, monitoring structures. In this talk, I will not formally define what I mean by monitoring structure, because that's not going to be the, uh, the focus of the talk. 
but you can see it in, in the paper. And also this is, those of you who come from game theory, it is very standard how we model uh, uh, all sort of partial way of monitoring uh, a game. What I want to uh, say that I, I do assume something that I will not even write because those of you who don't know this concept probably already assumed that they assume it. I am going to assume that everybody observes his own actions, own past actions. So when I come to play, I know what I played in the past and also that I don't forget things. So all these, both these things together in a fancy game theory language are called perfect recall. And again, those of you who don't come from game theory anyway, probably assumed that I'm assuming perfect recall. So I'm not writing it. Uh, I think at this point you should have in mind what I mean by a strategy of each player, what I mean by, by the lower value and upper value of a game, what I mean by determinacy. Uh, I am going to write it in a moment in a slightly more formal way, but if you think there is an act question that would be useful to ask now, then go for it. And sorry, I don't see your faces, so you will have to say it. Okay, so I'm going to assume that you are with me. I'm going to start with a few examples. Iran. Yes, this is Abraham. Iran. Yep. Right? I think yes. for the yes, I, I think it's better if you say that the determinacy in this case means that there is a value. Yes. Yes. Thank you. What because I mean by determinacy is the existence before of value. determinacy was uh, win loss usually people out again you we would think. Okay, thanks. Yes, I mean by the term I mean the existence of the value, the same thing that uh, Ron meant in his Blackwell game paper, right? Not, not in the first uh, Martin's paper uh, about ball game. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start with a few examples uh, in order to get a feeling of under which monitoring structures we actually get that the game admits a value. So let's look at, uh, at the game, uh, at uh, what... Uh, uh, I call the drinking game or a last man standing game. Uh, uh, each player has two actions in every period. The actions are uh, continue or quit. These two players are both stuck in a bar. Uh, every period they have to decide whether to take another beer or to just go, go home. And uh, uh, if we denote by uh, Ni the first period in which player I quit, then the winning set for player one, player one win if he left after uh, player two. Right, player one wins if he left after player two, or if player two stays forever, then and uh, player one left. So each player wants to get away from this thing, but he doesn't want to get away first. Right, so I want to get away, but I want to get away after my opponent leaves. However, if my opponent, I'm player one, if my opponent stays forever, then I don't plan to stay forever. I just, just want to quit, go home. Okay, notice that there is something asymmetric here in the uh, definition of the game because I'm looking at a win-loss game. In the game that I'm describing, if both of them stayed forever, then player two wins. Okay, so player two has some advantage in this game. Okay, is the game clear? Yes. So let's see what happens in the uh, examples that I, that I looked uh, at earlier. If there is a full monitoring, this is the alternating move game. This is the Borel games. Then player two has a winning strategy, right? Player one can do nothing. Whatever player one do, player two will look at him and immediately after player one quits, player two will quit. And if player one will never quit, then player two will never quit and again, player two will win. Okay, so this is what happens under full monitoring. Same thing under delay monitoring. 
if player two observes player one action, even at a delay of thousand, then there is no problem. I mean, player two would still stay in the game until he knows that player one left, and then he will leave. Okay. What happens under no monitoring? Well, under no monitoring, there is no value. I'm going to start using the term value instead of the term determinist, I think. Under no monitoring, there is no value. Player one cannot guarantee anything, but also player two cannot guarantee anything. Why player two cannot guarantee anything if there is no monitoring? Remember, what does it mean that player two can guarantee something? Well, what, what does it mean value? Value, we think about value as if player one already knows the strategy of player two, right? So if we fix a strategy of player two, let us denote by player two doesn't observe anything, right? It doesn't observe the action of player one. So a strategy of player two is just the period in which player two plans to quit if he plans to quit at all, right? So let's denote by FK probability that two quits before period K. This is FK. And F infinity, which is the limit of FK, is the probability that that two leaves at all at some point. So player one knows that there is uh, some probability that player two will leave until uh, uh, period k. You know that this thing goes to in, this thing has a limit. The limit is f infinity. If k star is such that fk star is greater than f infinity minus epsilon, then player one knows that, I don't know if player two plans to quit, but if he plans to quit, he will quit before period k star. So player one will just wait and wait and wait and wait, and he will quit at period k star plus one. Quit at period K star plus one, he wins. Wins with high probability, with probability at least one minus epsilon. Okay. So this is, uh, I mean, maybe maybe I should not even given you the proof. I should just said that this is, in this case, it is very similar to a game in which just player one has to pick n one, player two has to pick n two. They can randomize. And uh, this is the game in which the, uh, the player who picks the largest number wins, up to this small modification of what happens if they both uh, play infinity. Okay, any questions? So there is not, the game is not always, the, the, uh, does not always have a value. That's why, that's why I gave you all this example. Yeah, I have a question, if I may. Yes. Uh, if in this example, you know, if uh, player two, chooses quitting probabilities to sum up to one half and with probably one half he stays forever. Um, yes. Uh, th then and still, he can't the, the, guarantee the, almost uh, one half for himself? Player? No, he, he cannot guarantee almost one half because the, the, the quitting probability sums to one half. At some point, this sum is exhausted. There is some large period, thousand, that yeah. the probability up to this period, thousand is one half. And yes. after this period, thousand, there is no probability. So player one will just stay until period 1001. Then so yes, that. yes, but then player one wins with probably one half only, right? No, 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 we win with probability uh, 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 one because uh, look at the winning set. If player two stays forever and player one ah, leaves, then player one still Okay, wins. yeah, 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 then he also wins. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the part I forgot. Okay, thanks. Okay, no problem. So this game doesn't have a value. By the way, I'm, I'm uh, in this talk, I'm going to, I have, three goals. The first two of them is to show you that the problem is not trivial, but the proof is very simple. 
right? So I mean, it's kind of a delicate dance that I'm dancing. Right now, I'm still in the point in which I'm trying to say that the problem is not trivial. That's why I give you an example without a value, okay? So the general question is going to be under which monitoring structures there is a, a value. There is a value to the game, right? Some kind of a generalization of Blackwell game. But uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the already example in which it is not uh, trivial, everything I will do is not trivial and already everything I, I, I'm going to do is as difficult as what I'm going to do this is this. So you can have in mind the situation in which each player observes opponent's action with the delay one. Already this problem is not trivial. Uh, and maybe, maybe I will say in a minute, since you just saw one stock, what is the difference between this problem in which every player observes uh, his opponent's action with delay one and the Blackwell game setup? in which I also described it as kind of a, a imperfect monitoring, right? I chased only player one observe actions with delay. The difference is that in this case, uh, this case, the game admit proper subgames. Subgames are the points in the game after both players know, uh, played in which all players have the same information. And these subgames uh, popped up again and again in Ron Stock. But this game, this game doesn't have subgames in the proper sense. So there is no point in which all players, know, in which both players know the same thing. So there is the, the, all, the, all the argument that were based on, I'm going to restart things. I'm going to think about what happens from now onward. They are not as well defined as in the original game. So. Uh, I'm just saying it already now to say that maybe there is a way to generalize Martin's proof to my setup, but I, I tried it and I don't know uh, if it works. Uh, okay, so uh, a couple of uh, uh, um, formal uh, definitions, actually not really formal definitions, but more like annotations. I'm going to denote strategies by X and a strategy of player one is kind of a sequence. Sorry. Player one plays in the even periods, right? Uh, Xn is a function from information at period n to mixed actions, right? This is how I will play. Uh, uh, this is how I plan to play given my information at period N. So in the case of uh, Blackwell game, this was just the history of the game. Uh, in my case, this is not the, the history of the game. It's only the part of the history that I saw, right? That only the part of the history that I observed. And strategies Y of player two are defined analogously. These are the strategies. And I will say that the game has a value if the supremum over X of the infremum over Y of the probability over paths that is induced by X and Y of the set omega W, sorry, equals the inf sup. And I will call this thing the upper, the lower value of the game gamma. And I will call this thing the upper value of the game gamma. And the lower value is what player one can guarantee. And we already know that under some monitoring structures, there is a value and under some monitoring structures, there is no value. And before I'm telling you what is the monitoring structure that I'm going to look at under which there is a value, I'm going to give you the first idea of a proof. Idea of a proof that a value exists. And the idea is very simple. Let's assume, let's look instead of this game with imperfect monitoring, 
let's define the game gamma star, which is a standard Borel game, a Borel game with alternating move and complete perfect information. Okay? Is a standard Borel game. in which at period N, the player declares Xn or Yn. I mean, Xn if he's player one and Yn if he's player two. What are Xn and Yn? These are the thing. Instead of declaring, instead of choosing an action, instead of randomizing an action, he declares his plan. This is how I plan to choose my action. I'm going to uh, uh, randomize, given my information in this specific way. And you should think about it as if he's committed to this randomization. This is how he plans to uh, randomize his action. Okay. And then at infinity, After all is said and done, and all these players made this huge declaration every time how I would randomize given, all, given everything I know, at infinity, nature will perform all the randomizations. Nature will randomize a play path according to this probability Pxy that comes from all these xn and 1n, right? So when nature will declare a0, it will randomize according to x0. When nature will declare a1, it will randomize according to y1. When nature would choose a2, it will randomize according to x2, okay? Nature will perform all the randomization and declare the winner. Equivalently, since my players only care about expected payoff, each player, the, the, the player one will receive, or player two will pay player one uh, the probability of the winning set according to the uh, probability distribution that they, that they created, that they step-by-step step, uh, created. So we don't even need nature to randomize, we just, since we just cared about expectations. So this is just a standard Borel case, Borel game, not completely standard because the pair function is not win or loss. It's the kind of games that somebody I think in the in the workshop already talked of. There is a pair function, but it's an since it's an alternating move games and there is no issue of incomplete information. It's almost equivalent to a winning set, and this game is determined. Then there is a value. Right? So gamma star is determined. Gamma star as a value. This should be the value of the game. Why do I say that this should be the value of the game? I mean, in, in principle, in gamma star, the, the players have more information, right? I know how my, when I come to uh, uh, pick my actions, I know how my opponent was planning to pick his actions. So I have more information. But the intuition from uh, zero sum game is that this intuition, this more information is not useful in any way, right? I mean, I guess when you, uh, when you uh, were talking about the matching penny game in your classes and you told your students, uh, look, it's a good idea to play half half. The kind of reasoning that I say is the reasoning, uh, why should I play one half? Why should I play half half in uh, matching pennies? Because I'm always terrified that my opponent will steal my strategy, will know how I'm going to play. 
So if I'm going to play uh, 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 pennies, he's going to play the, the other thing. And if, and if I'm going to play zero, he's going to play one. If I'm going to play one, he's going to play zero. And since I'm so terrified that, that he would steal my strategy, I may as well tell him what my strategy is. I may as well tell him what, how I plan to uh, randomize, and I still don't lose anything. I still get the value of the game, right? If I just declare that I'm going to randomize half-half, then I'm going to get my uh, the half in expectation that I deserve, and uh, even if he steals my strategy, even if he knows what I'm playing, right? This is the basic idea of uh, minimax theorem. This is the reason uh, the, the most sexy story that people play is why did uh, the US randomized and which uh, nuclear sites they are going to check the Russian during the Cold War, because they say that whatever strategy we would have, the Russians will steal it, let's just randomize. Right? Rand, yes. You 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 reduced it to a black triple game, but you never no, not a black game. This, this gamma star is a is a Borel game. This gamma star is a Borel game. It's, a, it's, a Borel game. Yes. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you you didn't commented on the number of strategies the way that you defined it. Yes. The number of strategies is not finite. Any comments yes, on it? Yes, in Borel games, it doesn't matter. In Borel games, Borel games have a, 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 are determined even if the number of strategies is not finite. In alternating move games, when there, there is like one player, second player, they are moving and they observe each other actions, then they are also determined uh, uh, when the uh, uh, number of players is not finite. Uh, Perhaps I do need to make some modification because of the. Uh, uh, okay, I'm not sure if I need to make some modification now, but I will need to make some modification later. So we, will, so if I need them now, then I, I will go back to this question later. But for for general for Borel for Borel games with uh, with uh, alternating moves, you don't need and when there is alternating move and there is complete information, you don't need the set of actions to be finite. Okay, but I, I will. I think I will go back to this uh, issue later. So let's postpone it and then ask me again uh, later if I'm not clear. Okay, so uh, where was I? I was in the intuition. So that's why this is the intuition for this game. But and in principle, I could have said, okay, this is a proof of the theorem. But we know it cannot be a proof of the theorem. Why do we know that it cannot be a proof of the theorem? Because we know that actually the theorem is not correct when there is no monitoring, right? I just told you that the theorem is not correct when there is no monitoring, right? So I will not have time to do this, but for those of you who want to think about my talk after it is over, try to think what happens in this game gamma star in the case of non-monitoring. Try to think who wins in this game gamma star when there is no monitoring. What is the value of the game gamma star when there is no monitoring and why it doesn't match the value of the game gamma? Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if this detour was helpful. Uh, the purpose of this detour is to explain why I kind of expect gamma star to be a, a, a good game to look at, right? And why it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is that the intuition I told you that in zero sum games, you might as well reveal your strategy to the opponent. This is, intuition is correct, but the intuition relies on the existence of value. So if I'm looking at this thing, if I know that the value exists, then I might as well tell my opponent X. I might as well tell my opponent my entire strategy already at the beginning, and still, whatever he would do, whatever why he would choose, I would still get the value, right? But this entire intuition built on the assumption that the game has a value. I don't know yet that the game has a value, okay? So in principle, we have a theorem that says, which is kind of obvious from the definition, if gamma has a value, then what players can guarantee in gamma equals, then 
what I can guarantee in gamma, equals what I can guarantee in gamma star. But all this is true if the game has a value. It may happen that gamma star has a value and gamma doesn't have a value, okay? All this was part of telling you that what I'm going to do is not trivial. Hey, well, right? uh, Iran? Yes. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I got your name. Um, about the, the way you formulate this theorem, I'm just wondering why don't you just say that if gamma has a value, then this value equals the value, the of, value gamma of gamma star. star. I could have, you're right, I could have uh, done, done it. It's just, uh, it's going to flow more easily later when I will use this theorem, this uh, oh, formulation. You. But you're right, this is what essentially it says. That if gamma has a value, then, then gamma star also has a value and they have, the values coincide. However, the important thing is that the other direction is not true. Okay, so I think you're with me. Um, so, this is the last moment in the talk in which I'm trying to, at least for now, sorry, in which I'm trying to convince you that things are not trivial. From now on, I'm going to try to convince you that I have a very simple proof under an ass some assumption on the monitoring structure. Oh. Iran, what you are saying, up to now you convinced us it's not trivial and now you will convince us that it's trivial. Yeah, now I will, uh, yes, more or less, but in, in after I will now use like, uh, 30 minutes to try to convince you that it's trivial, and then I will have uh, 20 minutes left to convince you again that it's not trivial. So that's the plan. Uh, so under some assumption on the monitoring structure, which generalizes Blackwell assumption, I remind you that this was Blackwell assumption that one player observed uh, full monitoring and the other player was observed with delay. I'm going to prove existence of the value. Uh, the assumption that I make in the paper is actually more general than the assumption that I uh, that I uh, will make in the talk. But the 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 point I want to focus is is not so much the monitoring structure. So I'm going to make the simplest assumption that makes things not uh, not uh, included already in previous results. So the assumption that I make about the monitoring structure is just a, a delay monitoring. which means that the action of period K is announced, is revealed to the opponent at period MK for some increasing, for some function M, for some function M, such that of course uh, MK is greater than K. And, uh, and Iran, in fact, yes. Just to get some orientation, uh, because in this case, the other player knows exactly when you get your information. Yes. If instead of knowing it at period WK, you will have a distribution of the time by which you are being informed of the action, but you will know the realization of this random variable, not the opponent. Mm -hmm. So would the, would the proof the results be the same? So uh, when there is this, you added also stochasticity. Uh, yeah, the stochasticity the is just in order to make the situation so that the other player doesn't know when you get your information. Could yes. have built a more general model, but this is one simple model by yes. which the other one doesn't know when you get your information. So uh, I think for the specific uh, uh, um, structure that you described, I think the answer is yes, up to some uh, uh, changes. And uh, the first people who thought about it are uh, uh, Itai, uh, Ariely, and John Levy. So they have a paper about which generalize my paper to, uh, to stochastic setup. And I think what you just described uh, is included in their, uh, in their uh, um, uh, formulation. 
Uh, and there are also more general uh, monitoring structures that are deterministic in which I don't know exactly at which point you will uh, observe your information. For example, it can be that the delay depends on your own past actions. Uh, so the, the, I think what I captured in my paper is all the deterministic structures. And perhaps what uh, John and uh, Itai captured in their paper is all the stochastic structures, but I'm not sure how much they uh, pursued it. So, um, so for now, uh, I, I, I think the answer to your question is, is yes, but I'm not completely sure. Uh, uh, but for uh, the types of argument that I'm going to present in this talk, uh, already the case in which uh, MK is just K plus two, which means that I, I just don't observe the previous action of my opponent are already, uh, uh, is already like look to me like a difficult case, like a different case than uh, uh, everything uh, that was known before. So you can have in, you can keep in mind this case for the talk, okay? And uh, the, uh, if you're interested in the generalization of delayed monitoring for uh, deterministic monitoring structures, then you can look about at my paper. And if you are thinking about the generalization to stochastic monitoring structures, like the uh, uh, structure that Abram uh, just suggested, then uh, you can look at uh, the, the work by uh, Itai Reilly and John Levy. Uh, okay, so this is the thing. And now I'm going to give you the proof. And the proof is going to be based on the idea that I told you before, but with some small modification. I'm going to define the game gamma star, which is the same intuition of what I uh, 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 said before. In gamma star, at period n, the player declares xn or yn. You remember what xn and yn is. xn is the function from the information I have, information I'm supposed to have, the information I have in lambda, in gamma, at period n to delta a. This is the same thing like before. And they are still doing it alternating moves. Okay, so I declare my plan, uh, the opponent declares his plan, I declare, he declare, I declare, and with one, sorry, I, I wanted to denote the periods by K. It's too late for the things that are before, but. Uh, and with one modification, at period MK, nature randomizes AK. MK is the period in which in gamma, it becomes common knowledge that everybody knows everything. Right? right, that everybody, sorry, not that everybody knows everything, but it becomes common knowledge that everybody knows AK. Okay, and in the, uh, um, yes, so a uh, period K is the period in which it becomes common knowledge and the work that uh, uh, John Levy and Itai Ariely did is that it's not, you don't need common knowledge, it's sufficient that it would be common P belief for IP. So at period MK, nature randomizes AK. This is the only, uh, and, and the now at the end, uh, at the end, uh, the, you have the same winning set for player one and player two, okay? So player one win, if what they generated is in W, okay? So gamma star is the same gamma star that I defined earlier with one modification. Earlier, nature performed all the randomization at infinity. Now, nature randomizes at finite time. Iran, what is the difference between the two? Distance? What do you mean distance? The difference, what is the difference? between this gamma star and the previous gamma star. So in the previous gamma star, at infinity, 
nature performed all, random, all the randomizations. Yeah, I understand this, but why does it matter to the players? When okay, I didn't finish the proof yet. I'm going to, I mean, I have some proof to, I mean, even though I'm trying to convince you that it's really, I, I have some proof to show you that now things are, that now this thing will work, right? Okay. Okay. So nature I mean, and the it's a bit later, okay? I'm, I'm still in the middle of the... Uh, Just for me to, to understand the game, or uh, maybe it's a follow up on Elon's question. Uh, nature randomizes AK, but it's ah, not and the the so players, and is it? maybe that's, that's what, what Elon asked and announces it. Ah, okay, thanks. Okay, Elon, this is what you asked. I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't, I, I still don't see the difference because the players can, uh, can contemplate i mean what i mean if the nature chooses ak then i would play this way and if nature chooses another ak i would play differently and since yes, AK yes, yes. could I become think, common think... knowledge then it would be the same thing uh, so i don't understand uh, I... conceptually what is the difference between the two games i uh, i think that's the reason that, that you conceptually don't understand is the reason i gave all this story uh to show that there is something weird happening already in the first gamma star, right? Why does it matter to the player in the first gamma star that I presented? And I, I tried to emphasize this, this was the step in my proof when I tried to emphasize that, that things are not trivial. The same question that you ask now, I could ask about this gamma star. What does it matter to the player if they actually randomize gamma star at this point, if they randomize AK at this point, they announce it, or nature randomize it at infinity? if they can always contemplate and say what they would do given what they know. Well, it turns out that it matters. I have a I question think, now. Uh, I think your question me. is about the, the non-triviality of the first gamma star. It's, I mean, it, you, could also, you could also ask this question about what is it, this gamma star is different than the original gamma. It turns out that it's different, but this, is, this I don't want to answer because this I think is non-trivial. What I will answer is what is the advantage of my gamma star? But, but let me, I, let me, I mean, can I, can I ask a, a, one question here? What, as in, I mean, to me, an important difference between these two is that this one is finite, the other one is infinite. What do you mean finite? The, the, this is a finite set now. As in, at each point in time, you only have sort of a finite amount of, of things you don't know. Yeah, also in the previous game, and each point of time, we also. No, have no, 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 you, no that, that everything is first randomized at the end. So there's infinitely much, you need sort of to, to have an infinitely big strategy up there, while- I know, don't know, I mean, I, I don't want to get into this uh, argument because I mean, it's not uh, my, it's not my, my main thing, but I don't understand what you say. In terms of, uh, I mean, in both games, at every period, the players, then the, the, uh, every period itself is finite. So the players only knows uh, finitely many things. Uh, in this game and also in this game, uh, Gamma Star. Uh, and the original game. Uh, it assumes Gamma a finite Star, monitor, right? I mean. That you don't even need to randomize at all at infinity. It's just equivalently to say that uh, uh, player two uh, plays player one the probability. But look, I don't want to get into this uh, argument. I mean, I, uh, I, if you think that they are uh, completely different, then that's fine with me. I mean, I'm, I'm part of what I claim is that they are completely different. Uh, yeah. And I'm, I'm going to continue by telling you how I'm using this gamma star in order to prove the existence of a value. Uh, this gamma star is no longer a Borel game. It is no longer an alternating move game. This gamma star is the stochastic game that uh, Ron uh, presented, uh, that Ron finished his previous talk with, okay? Gamma star is a stochastic game. It's the generalization of Blackwell game. It doesn't have simultaneous moves, but somehow when, when you already have chance, when you add chance move, then the simultaneous moves doesn't make it more difficult. Gamma star is a stochastic game. It has chance move. That's why I call it a stochastic game. Unlike the previous game that essentially didn't have chance move because uh, as I said, instead of chance making all the randomization, you can just uh, uh, give the players their expected payoffs. So gamma star is a stochastic game. Therefore, 
it is the it has a value. Earlier I appealed to Martin's first paper. This is because of Martin's second paper. And now I will go back to uh, Abraham's question from before, and I will say that here I'm cheating a bit because in the for Blackwell games you do need the strategies set to be uh, finite, right? And here. Uh, they are not finite, right? Because a function to delta a. So uh, I'm going to replace delta a by a, a sufficiently uh, what's the uh, fine grid in delta a. Okay, that's not going to matter much. So I'm going to uh, make grids which is uh, up to epsilon uh, approximate delta A and I will need these epsilons to go down very quickly uh, with K. Uh, but uh, after I do that, this is not going to matter much. This is like they choose an action from delta A. So I'm go not going to um, talk a lot about this uh, issue. Um, this is, uh, um, this is, uh, it, it's rather intuitive, right? That I can uh, replace the randomization with the randomization of, uh, of a finer and finer uh, uh, grids from the mixed strategies in order to make this thing finite, okay? So at this point, I'm assuming that you all know what is gamma star, perhaps except for this uh, small technical issues of uh, finiteness of the uh, action set. You all agree with me that gamma star is uh, uh, is uh, determined, it has a value. And I'm going to say that the value of gamma star, I'm going to prove to you that the value of gamma star, gamma also has a value and val gamma equals val gamma stars. I'm going to prove to you, I'm going to have a very simple proof for it but it's not completely trivial. Why it is not completely trivial? Because I already gave it gamma star that looks very, very similar. And that one we saw that the fact that that gamma star has a value doesn't imply, didn't imply that gamma has a value. So I still need to tell you why the fact that this gamma star has a value implies that gamma has a value and it's the same value, okay? And Somehow it's very intuitive uh, because I think it's very intuitive because we have in mind this intuition that in a zero sum game, okay, so what you declare your strategy, you declare how you plan to mix, but this is all the idea of zero sum game that you can declare how you plan to mix. But it's the whole idea after we know that the game has a value. Here we don't yet know that gamma has a value. Okay, so now the simple thing. First, for a, there is a class of winning sets for which I do know that gamma has a value. There is a very simple class of winning set for which there is a value. So let's call it theorem, another theorem. If W is closed, then gamma has a value. And if W is closed, then gamma has a value under any monitoring structures. Including the no monitoring structure that I uh, presented to you before. So if W is closed, this is a very simple thing. It doesn't require any assumption. Gamma has a value. Why does gamma has a value? This follows from general min-max theorems. If you look at the normal form gain, normal form gain is the game which we collapse everything to a, a one-shot game. We think about the game as a game in which player one chooses X, player two chooses Y, and this is the payoff function, okay? And if w, w is closed, then the set of strategies of player one 
in the normal form gain is compact. Uh, strategies of player one is compact. The set of pure strategies is compact. And the, um, the pair function is upper semi-continuous. And for this type of game, where there, there is a kind of the standard generalization of, uh, of the Minimax theorem to, uh, to general topological space uh, says that there is a value, right? So what you need for a value is that one of the player will have compact set of strategies and the, the payoff to that player would be upper semi-continuous. So uh, uh, if, if W is closed, then W, then gamma has a value under any monitoring structure, okay? And, and the, 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 the original W that I gave you here in my example was not closed. That, that's why there was no uh, monitoring structure. Okay, so now five minutes for the real proof. The thing I'm using in my proof is just is that gamma star has a value. In addition to the fact that gamma star has a value, one thing that follows for, Ma for Martin's theorem, which I really, really hoped and I actually assumed that Ron will mention because I think it's very important but uh, I think he didn't, so I will mention it. Uh, one of the, uh, for me, the fundamental thing that comes out of Martin's theorem is not just that the game has a value, but also in addition, there exists a closed set, closed and actually compact because everything here is compact. It's a finite uh, set of actions. So let's, let's give me right compact. Such that value of the play of the original game gamma star, let me write it gamma star W in order to emphasize that the winning set is W. is approximated by the value of, sorry, I feel that I, that I didn't give much respect to uh, this thing. Let's see if I can, I mean, I, I don't think, think it's even clear. Let's see if I can. I said that this is very important and then I write it like in, in, a, in a handwriting that you can see. There exists a compact set that approximates the winning set from below such that already on this compact set, player one can guarantee Already on this compact set, player one can guarantee the value up to epsilon. So uh, the quantifier on epsilon is here. This follows from Martin theorem that what I can guarantee on, the value that I can guarantee on the winning set I can already guarantee it on a smaller compact set, okay? This follows from Martin's proof and I will, if I will have time, I will get to it uh, later because it, it relates to the last part of my talk in which I'm going to convince you that uh, things are not trivial. For now, uh, uh, just accept it. Or, uh, or those of you who know, uh, who, who have seen it. I don't know if somebody talked about it before. Uh, maybe you will just accept it for now and I will get back to it later. 
but this is not my idea. This 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 was included in Martin's theorem. So maybe I will cite I, I'll cite Martin's uh, in in Martin's papers. Is show it, but also uh, uh, Maitre and Suders showed it before uh, under the assumption of existence. But I mean, they didn't show the existence of value, but they showed the false for uh, the quantity that player one can guarantee. <clears throat> So they showed this for the uh, lower value and upper value of the game. Somebody had a question? No, I just want to say it will appear in the talk tomorrow also. Ah, okay, cool. So I wish I was uh, talking after that talk, but too late now. <clears throat> okay, so. Gamma star has a value. My, my uh, uh, gamma star, you remember that I defined a new uh, game gamma star. This is the game gamma star that I defined. This gamma star has a value. I'm going to prove to you that this is also the value of gamma. I'm going to, to, I have to prove to you that gamma has a value and that the value of gamma is this value of gamma star. I need to prove to you that each player can guarantee in gamma what he can guarantee in gamma star. So I need to prove claim. Every player can guarantee the value of gamma star in gamma. Well, let's see be a subset of W, which is compact. And player one can guarantee when the winning set is C. How do I know that there exists such a See, well, that's what I just told you. Martin proved for me. Martin proved for me. Okay. But gamma this star C is the truth, right? What? Sorry. This is the, this is the result that you quoted for Suda. Yes. yes, this is the result that I quoted for Martin and for my and Suda. So my and Suda actually proved it for the for the lower value what the player can guarantee okay. yeah and and what i need is is actually just what my trans what i need here is actually just what my trans would have proved yes so there is uh this compact set c so we know that in gamma star c the player can guarantee this but if you can guarantee this in gamma star c Therefore, he can also guarantee this in gamma C. How do I know that if he can guarantee this in gamma star C, he can also guarantee it in gamma C? Because gamma C is determined. I already know that gamma C is determined because C is closed. And earlier I had this theorem that I think Arkady asked me about. Earlier I said, this is the theorem that actually came out from the standard intuition of game theory. If the game does have a value, then you might as well reveal your strategies, your video, reveal your plan. Gamma C, I already know that it has a value. Therefore, what I can guarantee in gamma star, I can also, I can also what I can guarantee in gamma, what I can guarantee in gamma star is the same thing. But if I can guarantee this value in gamma C, then of course I can guarantee this value also in gamma W because C is contained in W. C is smaller set than W. Whatever I can get in C when the winning set is C, I also get when the winning set is W. Therefore, we are done. I just told you that player one can guarantee this value already in gamma. The same thing also for player, player two. I mean, this, is, this thing is completely symmetric between the players. And this proves the theorem. It proves that both players can guarantee the value of gamma star in the original game gamma. Okay, so 
I think the proof is very simple. It just relied on this very deep fact that the value uh, on these two very deep facts. One, the fact that there is a value, right? So what player one and player two can guarantee in gamma star are the same thing. And the other thing is this result, which I said is actually uh, less deep because my and Suder uh, proved it even without uh, 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 Martin's theorem, but is also, it is, I think it's very important, is this result that you can approximate from below the uh, lower value and the upper value. Eran, okay. where does this proof fail for the game gamma star that you started with and was not good? Uh, where does this thing fail for the game? The, the, this thing doesn't hold. Uh, where, 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 where is it? Uh, this, this part doesn't hold. <laughs> that doesn't exist. Why? Uh, Why doesn't it hold? I mean, we know by Martin that there is always uh, a compact subset C. That, uh, or a closed subset C. Uh, the original game was not a win-loss game. The original game, if you remember, was mm. a game in which at infinity nature will perform uh, uh, this, this game. Okay. It gives the expectation. It was not a, a win-loss game. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, I think I'm going to now, uh, I'm, I'm, going, I'm now, uh, go, switch to the last part of my talk in which I'm going to again, I'm going to do several things. First, again, try to convince you that there are non trivial things here, and also try to explain mm -hmm. the difficulty that I encounter when I try to um, uh, generalize this for an arbitrary pair function. And I think this will, uh, will also circle around the same issue that Elon was pointing to. Um, was there another question? Sorry, I think I cut somebody. You cut me, I wanted just to, to, to ask you to do the elaboration on this point when the payoff is a general function. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to now elaborate on, on what are the difficulties, wh why I cannot generalize it to the general payoff function. Uh, and, and also I will, uh, and I, so I'm going to do two things, uh, explain why I cannot generalize it. And also I will talk a bit more about these properties that I, I view as like super important, okay? So first, let's let's look again at this property. Uh, again, remind remind you what this theorem says of Martin and Maitre and Suder say that whatever you can guarantee, you can already guarantee on a smaller compact set. Okay, this actually looks very similar to something that you know probably from real analysis uh, one hundred one, right? You remember this thing. If U is a probability measure, and W is a set, then for every epsilon, for every epsilon exists a compact set in W such that mu of C plus epsilon is greater than mu of W, right? This is the property that, uh, that I mean, I have to some assumptions on the underlying probability space, the underlying space should be compact or something. Yeah. Uh, Run two but, points. One you, yes. You, one, you have to quantify mu. It's not an arbitrary probability measure. And B, you have to say, uh, one has to say the drill analysis 101 in Israel is not what the people study elsewhere. Ah, okay. So uh, how do I have to quantify uh, mu? Mu is a probability measure over Borel sets. Is there another thing I had to say? And, and the space is compact. I think that's it. Correct. Okay. Uh, so this looks very much like the property that uh, we looked at, except that the uh, uh, upper, the lower value of the game is not a probability measure, right? It's not a probability measure, uh, therefore I cannot use it uh, uh, immediately, but it is a, what 
what's called shocket capacity. This is the property that uh, Mitra and Suder use. And I'm going to put it on an asterisk because it's not completely accurate what I say. I'm just um, uh, giving you a pointer. Those of you who want to look how Mitra and Suder proved it, since I will, I will, if I will have time, I will go through the Martin route. But those of you who want to look how Mitra and Suder proved it, which may be more like basic principles, then the pointer is Choquette's uh, capacity theorem. And uh, these, these types of properties also uh, uh, holds for Choquette's capacity theorem. Let's try to look at the generalization of this result from real, anal real analysis uh, 101 to function. This is something that you maybe not seen in, in, uh, in the Israeli version of uh, real analysis 101, but it's easy to prove. If f is a Borel function, Then, again, for every epsilon, and mu is a measure, for every epsilon, there exist upper semi-continuous function age, which is below f, and the integral of f with respect to mu is approximate the integral of, sorry, the integral of age approximate the integral of f. So the same way that every set is essentially a compact set up to some uh, a small uh, uh, garbage, right? Every function is, uh, is approximated from below by upper semi-continuous functions. And this looks awesome, right? Uh, maybe I will just remind you what an upper semi-continuous. By upper semi-continuous, I mean that uh, uh, the set of all uh, uh, the set of all x's such that a x is greater or equal to something is closed. Uh, this is upper semi-continuous. This is awesome because upper semi-continuous functions are exactly the functions which, the pair of functions which I needed in my theorem. You remember I had this theorem, if W is closed, then gamma has a value under no monitoring. It is also true that if we look at a general pair function, which is upper semi-continuous, then gamma has a value under any monitoring structure for exactly, exactly the same reason. What I needed in order to apply the minimax theorem is upper semi-continuity, right? So this looks awesome. Stefan, yes. Do, do you need the, in the last result on the function f that it is bounded? Ah, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. You're right. Is a bounded Borel function. Uh, so this looks pretty awesome, right? Because this is this is exactly what I needed, except that. It is not true, the analog result uh, about what players can guarantee is not true for arbitrary pair function. So if you look at Martin's theorem and if I will have at Martin's proof and if I will have uh, uh, five minutes at the end, I will, I will go through it. What Martin proof for a general pair function And this is the best that you can prove, I think. I mean, you, you, I mean, it's not true that you can approximate the uh, value from below. Uh, Martin, uh, what year is it? Uh, 1998, right? This is the paper that Ron just uh, uh, presented. What Martin proof is that Blackwell games with a payoff function f which is bounded and Borel have value, a value, and there exist for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists age smaller than F such that the value when the pair function is age plus epsilon 
is greater than the value. So there exists an approximation, but age as the property is a link soup function. What is a limb soup function? A limb soup function is a function that a of x, x is, uh, uh, how did you denote an infinite history? Let me put like that. Age of uh, an infinite uh, a play path is the limb soup of some functions that depend only on the first coordinates. This is what this is what holds for a, a, a arbitrary pair function, uh, which if I will try to write it in the same way that I write uh, this, is that the set of all x's such that a of x is greater than r is I think it means that it's g delta. It means that this set is g delta, not that this set is closed. Okay, for G delta sets, it's no longer true that for, uh, for, uh, for these limb soup functions, then the theorem that I used that regards the unit of the value is not longer true. Okay, so the, the difference for me, assuming that my route is correct, the difference for me between uh, uh, the case of an, a, a win loss game and the case of a pair function is exactly the approximation theorem. The approximation theorem that Martin proved for a, a win-loss set is, a, is a better. I mean, it's not just the proof, right? This is the approximation theorem that is correct, right? The, it's no, not true that, uh, that you can approximate from below by upper semi-continuous functions. Okay, so the, the difference for me is that when you have a win-loss game, you can approximate the pair function from below by an upper semi-continuous function. When you have an arbitrary pair function, you cannot approximate it from below by an upper semi-continuous function. Okay. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a good place for questions. If not, what I can do is talk a bit more about stuff which is not my stuff, but it's a bit more about these two approximations theorem and show how they can come up from uh, how they come up from Martin's proof, assuming you all have uh, the proof that uh, Ron gave fresh in your mind. I have a question, Aaron. Sure. So you mentioned this uh, non-additive probability, uh, Schocke capacity. So what is the, why is it important here to mention? The, the reason I mentioned it, uh, actually, it's a good uh, thing. The reason I mentioned it is because I thought, I mean, I, I think that if some, if, uh, uh, if somebody wants to uh, uh, generalize my theorem, then uh, I feel that the, uh, that this part of the argument that I used um, uh, may be understood better through uh, Schockett's capacity through this paper of uh, Mitra and Suder, mm -hmm. and not through the way that I understand it now, which is through Martin's proof. So that's the only reason I, I said it, that maybe maybe that, that paper can be useful to generalize uh, my paper to arbitrary pair functions. Maybe I will mention another paper that can be useful to generalize uh, my paper to arbitrary pair function. Mitra and Suder has another uh, proof of uh, existence of value in Blackwell game, which is specifically for this type of limb soup functions. Um, and uh, uh, this is an earlier paper than Martin's paper. It's a different proof. And perhaps that proof can be uh, uh, used to prove uh, uh, existence of value with uh, uh, under my conditions, under my monitoring conditions. And if you do that, I mean, if you, if you prove existence of value for limb soup functions, then the same idea of my proof would generalize it to an arbitrary Borel functions. 
So, Aaron, so this this proof isn't it using a transfinite induction to to yes, yes, to the calculate the value we calculate is not the yes, good word, yes. but so then then you also enter this type of transfinite induction things uh, then in that in your plan or uh, I don't think I mean I, I don't I don't know I mean I, I did try a bit to generalize their proof to my uh, setup the, the the problem I encounter is, is that they also use these uh, sub games like Martins and I, I didn't know how to accommodate it um, so I don't I don't know I mean I, I think it may be generalized I don't think the problem is the transfinite induction the problem that I encountered is in the uh, in the sub game property but let me since I said it let me just uh, leave you with with what I think is the simplest open question that remains here uh, assume pair function as is assume pair functions is lim soup and the monitoring is delay one is uh, delay one both players observing delay one then uh, i don't know if the game has a value but i do know that my proof idea i mean if you prove it for pair functions which are lim soup then you can use the same machinery that i just presented to you and prove it for arbitrary Borel function. Uh, I have a question, but I left to leave in four minutes. So, okay, so uh, go uh, quickly and uh, we start. We started later, so you question. have you have still no, time. No, I have another meeting that I have to go. Uh, so the question is the following: uh, You don't know if for a general function f there exists a value. The right. question is if you would have restricted the strategies to be completely mixed, let's say for each decision node, you have to take at least with probability epsilon one completely fixed, completely mixed strategy mixed with the rest, would you then be able to prove the result that the value does exist. Because in that case, you might be able to prove this approximation for compact from arbitrary sets with compact sets to continuous functions or upper semiconductors. Uh, that's interesting. Actually, it's, uh, I mean, I, I think I, I uh, I think I have in mind uh, the kind because of intuition. In, in, in this case, what you will have that the defined distribution might be above some distribution with full support. And in that case, you might use the lemma of the approximation to get a better approximation for functions. Uh, I, I, uh, I agree that it is possible. I don't, but I don't know. I mean, I, it's not something I, I, I it's, uh, it's something like a, like a very good uh, uh, direction. It's actually interesting, not, not just in terms of my uh, uh, result, it's interesting in general, right? In terms of this approximation result, would this approximation result hold uh, for um, complete for for I mean I guess you say completely mixed you mean bounded away by some uh, oh, zero yeah bounded away yeah uh, I think I think okay, it's a, I think it's an excellent question mixed strategy and you say it's a mixture every mixed strategy will be a mixture of this with probability at least epsilon and the rest yes so this will uh, tell you some some distance from the boundary for each uh, decision point. Uh, I, I uh, agree, it's a, it's a great question. I don't have uh, an immediate answer. Uh, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's uh, I actually, uh, I think I, I understand the intuition you have and I actually think it may be true. And in this case, I think it would be interesting for its own sake even. Uh, because I because I view this approximation theorem as very important for, for their own sake. Okay. Yes. Thanks. It's a it's a great. Uh...
It's a great question, but I don't have something. Okay, thank you. And yeah. sorry that I have to leave, but I had something sure. planned before. Uh, I can uh, stop sharing, assuming nobody has a question that will uh, require. Uh, Aran, I, I do. I do. Please, please don't, don't stop. Ah, okay. If, if you could. Okay. So, uh, um, yeah. I have a question, maybe more of a remark, but uh, before I ask my question, I would like to thank you for your very nice talk um, around. So you, you mentioned uh, the, 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 um, the proof of um, the, the proof of my trans from um, 1993. Uh, the fact uh, that the value is a capacity, but maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's true for gambling problems. So maybe it's even true for one player games, but I'm yeah, not so sure. That, that's that's one reason why, yeah, why I say this. Uh, you, you, you're right. Uh, that's, that's why I said uh, uh, all these stars. Uh, but uh, when you look at the upper value of the game, like what, uh, what is the worst thing that can happen to me, uh, for a fixed strategy of player two, then I, I'm, 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 I'm my own, like fixed strategy of player two, then I am, uh, uh, I am essentially in, in a, as, as player one, I am in a, in a, a gambling problem, right? Like a fixing a strategy of player two, and I'm just looking at the supermoon that I can get. So if you look, if you look at the, at the at this uh, uh, inf soup, then fixing a strategy of player uh, two, what I can get is I'm essentially in a gambling uh, house. And I, I made a couple of inaccuracies there. That's why I, I think I, I made the point of uh, of uh, writing here uh, some star and saying that I'm not completely correct, but the reason I don't want to get into the details is because I don't want to assume that people even remember what the capacity is. So, uh, but you're right. But the, 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 their basic idea, they, they, they used the machinery of, of uh, uh, Choquette capacity in order to prove the existence of the value. It's not that the value itself is a capacity. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's this going up property that I think is the problem for for games, but is okay for gambling. no. But 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 look, what I needed from for my theorem is just the the approximations of the of the upper value. It's not the it's not the, the value itself, right? Uh, and and in fact, again, this going up property that's another place where I was not completely accurate. They didn't prove it on on this upper value. They proved it on some modification of the upper value which uh, allows you also to live at, uh, at uh, some points. That's why, I mean, I was not completely accurate there, but I just wanted to mention that it comes from uh, Shoket Capacity's theorem. But that I just wanted to mention that I use this fact and, it, and I, I attribute it to Martin, but it, that what I need actually was proved before by uh, Mitra and Suder using um, uh, Shoket's capacity. And, and I think it's, it's something that is worth uh, looking at. OK, so um, I'm going to start. No, maybe I'm intrigued with the open problem that you mentioned. This is delay one. So what is the intuition or what's intuitively very different in delay one and delay two? Like ah, delay two is also difficult. I, I'm, I'm saying delay one just because it's like the simplest thing. The simplest that I case. Mm -hmm. Okay, but why you no, believe every, it's every, every <laughs> delay that is not uh, that doesn't create proper sub games. So everything that players know different things along the play path all the time. These are the things I don't know how to generalize. This is just the simplest one that I don't know how to generalize. I'm not sure. Did, did I answer your question? Um, yes, you did. Thank you. Aram, may I ask you one more question? I already asked many questions. I hope you, you don't mind sure. me asking one, one, one more. Um, sure. What I find fascinating about uh, these approximation results in Martin and in uh, Maitra and, and Surf is the fact that there seems to be a slight gap 
um, between the two setups. So if we have winning sets, then um, we know that uh, the, 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 the value could be approximated by a compact set from within, okay? Mm -hmm. But if we have a, uh, just a, a, fun a Borel measurable function, then uh, we can't approximate the value uh, by uh, the value of an upper semi-continuous function, which would be you know, the, the generalization of uh, the fact for winning sets. We can only do so with lean soup functions. And I, I've been always wondering, um, is there some kind of a more general statement um, that, that will give uh, you know, both these theorems are special cases. Uh, maybe you thought about this. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I did uh, think of it. first. I, I just have to uh, object to your saying small gap. This gap is the reason why I cannot prove my theorem, right? As I for, for arbitrary per function, right? This is I, I, the reason I talked about it uh, like 20 minutes is because I think it's a huge gap. Right, that's why I can prove uh, uh, my theorem for a winning set, and I cannot prove it for uh, uh, arbitrary pair function. Uh, I it's a it's a small it's a it's a small gap for Iran, but a huge gap for uh, for humankind. No, yes. Yeah, so, so for me, it's a huge gap already, right? Because it's uh, it, uh, uh, because it prevents me from proving uh, my theorem. But I think actually to. Uh, to deduce the, the fact that you can approximate by upper semi-continuous uh, from the fact that, at least from Martin's proof, I mean, in Martin's proof, uh, it's actually, uh, I, I don't want to get it to now because we are like in the, in the last uh, two minutes that I have, but Martin's proof is, first he gives a, a second proof, which is, which is way simpler for the case of the winning set is, uh, is the, in, for the case of the, of a winning set, but also if you look at his proof, uh, uh, the, the, this limb soup function actually comes from the non-magical part of, maybe I will uh, stop showing that uh, because I'm not going to use my, uh, uh, my slides anymore and this way at least I will, uh, uh, I will see your faces. Uh, so uh, this part, this approximation part, the fact that uh, the fact that you can uh, um, approximate the value from below by a limb soup function, this actually comes from the part of Martin's proof that for me is not magical. This part from the fact that if player one has this proof that the value is greater than, uh, than V, then uh, 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 from this proof, he already in this proof, he already announces for every node in the uh, in the tree, he already announces what he claim he can get from that node onward, right? And this function is the limb soup function. Is the, the 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 whole idea is that already on this limb soup, already on the limb soup of these functions, he can guarantee uh, 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 he, uh, the the expectation of the limb soup of this function is already at least the value of the game, and the limb soup of this function is smaller than the pair function in the game, right? So this is the, this is the part that, uh, that is, is not the magic of uh, Martin's proof, right? That, that's again why I think that this part is, is more, the approximation is more basic than the existence of the value. And it also matches the fact that my transfer have a different problem. Now, if you just take this function and modify it by a bit, the function that comes from Martin proof and you just modify it for, uh, like you fix an epsilon and every time you are below, you, the first time you get below epsilon, you just declare it to be zero. And as long as you are above epsilon, you call it one, then you will get the upper semi-continuous that corresponds to a winning set. So uh, that's why I, uh, I, yeah, so that's one difference between the winning set uh, and the pair function. I think in, in, if you look at Martin's theorem, at Martin's paper, it's, it, he does it. Uh, very clearly. Uh, what I would like to know, and I don't know, is the analog of uh, Mitra and Sudarth argument to this general uh, pair function. This thing I don't know, and this thing I think is missing, and if I knew this, maybe I would have a better understanding of um, the situation. But... Okay, I guess I'm over my time and uh...
uh, probably we already lost most of the data. So. No, no, thank you. Uh, we have time for questions and discussions as you know, it's for free, so. Uh, okay, uh, I, I'm, I, I said what I had to say. Uh, like, ah, or maybe I will also say that, uh, I mean, I have other open questions in the paper. So if you're interested in it, you can go on there. Actually, Iran, so as you mentioned this capacity again, so, but this capacity itself is a very general notion. So we, some, sometimes we are very interested in special capacities. Do we know anything about it? What kind of capacities uh, we have, is it, uh, we have or, or, or it is not a point in here because the approximation works in general. At, uh, uh, I know very little about it. I only know, uh, I, I only knew it actually from, I mean, it, it also, uh, the, this, the same arguments are the arguments that are usually used to prove that uh, analytic sets are uh, measurable, are the big measurable. That's how it, I think that's how it, uh, it is usually presented in textbooks. Um, I'm, I'm, I feel that uh, in, uh, in, in my transudor's paper, it, it has maybe a somewhat different role. Uh, I don't know if they need to talk about analytic sets in order to even, I mean, in order to this to be non-trivial. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I actually, I, I also, I mean, when I, when I worked on this, I, 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 I felt that I understood the, I fully understood Martin's uh, paper and I felt that it contains everything but that I need to know, but now I'm not sure about it. So maybe, maybe it's worth, uh, yeah, I think it's worth looking. I think, I think they, they did something for more basic principles than Martin at least at that point. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if somebody talked to <laughs> Sorry, my son, you know, discussing some related, related things, sorry. Related things, okay. Okay, so uh, see you again, uh, I guess, uh, tomorrow. Yeah, thank you very much, Iran. Thank Thanks. you.